This is the MFG Monkey Podcast. We sit down with leaders and innovators in the industry to talk about manufacturing, business, and the stories behind their successes. I'm your host, Dust McMillan, owner and founder of McMillan Co. Zach, welcome. How are you, buddy? I'm doing pretty well. How are you, Dustin? I'm doing awesome. I really appreciate you uh, jumping on to MFG Monkey and and uh, chatting with me today. Oh yeah, no, um, super super excited, and I really you know I appreciate you reaching out to ask me if I if I'd come on. Yeah, so. absolutely. No, we uh, kind of hit it off once we were introduced. Uh, probably it was a year, year and a half ago now, maybe longer. Yeah, I think I was out in your, I, was, I think I was at your facility, yeah, probably a year and a half ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and we, we've always leaned on you guys quite a bit, just, um, you know, getting up and running with uh, the machine that we bought from you and Preco has always been just phenomenal to work with because it is new to us and uh, we kind of jumped into the converting industry, both feet and and never, <laughs> never looked back, so so your guys' uh, guidance has been been exceptional for us. Oh uh, yeah, no, I appreciate that. That um, uh, that's kind of a byproduct of enjoying what you do, and that's not just me speaking about myself personally here at Preco, but just everybody here. Um, uh, we're we're pretty passionate about our business. So yep, no, and and that shows. I mean, not. Um, I think Steve was the one that came out to help us. You know, mm-hmm. get our machine set up. We we had him out a, a couple times, I believe, and yeah. just his willingness to help and just laid back and, yeah. uh, you know, how he teaches and and things like that. And then anyone in, you know, inside Preco, if you're not available, you know, anyone's more than willing to help us and answer questions and help us understand what we don't know. So yeah, yeah, you know, that's um, that's kind of one of the things that we're. Um, really proud of is, you know, we've got um, nearly 50 years of collective uh, converting experience and a lot of tribal knowledge built in. And, um, you know, when you do business with us, that's that we, we, we share all that, you know, we're not, yeah. we're not converters. We're just making the equipment. So we want our converters to go out and be successful. Sure. Yeah. yeah and we, and, man, you guys uh, have really helped us just, we take on very challenging products. I think, uh, mainly because we want to separate ourselves from the industry. The machine that we bought from you is, is extremely capable. Uh, so we're, we're able to take those projects on confidently, but a lot of times I'll get ourselves into something and I'm like, all right, I don't know. I know this thing is capable of doing it, but I don't know how. <laughs> so, um, well, I- I remember um, the first time we met face to face. I remember you saying that that we're you, you said we're going to go after the jobs that nobody else wants to tackle. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know that that that's huge. That's a that's um, there's a lot out there in that arena, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And there, the one project that I can think of that you helped us out tremendously with was it was a military project. It, it seemingly it was simple, but we were holding to such a high tolerance with a target and uh we you helped us get that lined out it took us took us a little bit to get the machine lined out a lot because the media came in and it was uh wasn't consistent and uh and there were some there were some issues there but we ended up uh just crushing that project we ran close to a million pieces uh we took our customers scrap level from what they were doing previously uh over 70 percent and we I think we delivered well under 3% scrap. Wow. That's great. So that's fantastic. I mean, that, yeah. That's huge, right? Yeah. Oh, and it saved, it, it, it saved them hundreds of thousands of dollars and a lot of it. Well, it, it was the machine, you know, just the, the digital locator and you helped, uh, h- helped us understand how, you know, where that target needed to be located and, and how to get the machine set up. And, you know, there's, a lot of learning on our end because we had never done it before. Uh, but man, our team just knocked it out of the park. You were on, I think you were on FaceTime with Diego quite a few yeah. times helping and, and things like that. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah no problem. I, I, I always make a joke about it, about how I'm never off the clock. Um, 
and, and right. I'm not. But my 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 wife doesn't think the jokes as funny as I do. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, when when you're in sales or yep. when you run your own deal, it, it kind of never never mm-hmm. ends, and it takes that passion to be successful. So, yeah. And, and you you have that with all the videos that you have and and things like that. So, you know, teaching is the best sales tool, I believe. I would 100 percent agree with you. Um, and it it it's kind of hard for me sometimes to call myself a sales guy because I haven't, I've only been on that side of it for my career for relatively a short time in the grand scheme of things, but I've kind of always come from a teaching background. I mean, I grew up, both my parents were teachers um, and coaches and I've always coached and taught and that part of it to me has always been kind of second nature and I really enjoy it. So um, I, I hope it's helped me, um, become a, a, a good salesperson. Um, but, uh, that's definitely the side I lean on hardest is being a, a, a teacher yeah, and yeah. sharing. Right. Yep. Well, and, and when you take that approach the you know, the old school days of, uh, you know, the ABCs with, um, I can't even remember what the hell that movie is called now, but it's, I'll remember it here in a minute, but I mean, those days are gone. It's all about teaching and relationships and, and doing stuff like this. You know, I, I want, um, you know, our time together today to leave some sort of an impression with somebody to help them understand, you know, something that they didn't know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, same with me. I, you know, I'm sure I'm going to learn a dozen things while we're, while we're chatting. Well, I hope so, but no guarantees. <laughs> <laughs> hey, understood, understood. But I mean, even, you know, you talking about coaching and teaching and, and all that, that's one thing I learned about you last week is you're a dive instructor too. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, I, I tend to, to go all in on things when I get passionate about them. Yeah. Um, it's kind of interesting. I, I've, I had always wanted to dive my entire life and like all things found excuses not to do it. And about, eight or nine years ago, um, you know, I was just kind of sitting there thinking, and I was like, you know, there's no guarantees that um, when I, that I'm going to be able to do this physically, mentally, financially, at the time plan, I was planning on going and getting certified. I was like, to hell with it. I'm just going to go do it. Yep. And so I enrolled uh, in a, in a basic open water dive class. And dove for a couple of years, um, just as a basic open water diver, had a blast. And then my oldest son at that time turned 10, which is the minimum age you can um, become certified diver. And so I went to the shop that I was diving through and I talked to the owner and I said, hey, my my son wants to get certified. I'm like, will you certify him? And he kind of sat there and he thought about it for a second. And he goes, I will. He goes, but <laughs> if I certify him you've got to get certified as a rescue diver because you can rescue him, but he can't rescue you. Right. Which made total sense, right? You know, you're, sure. you're, it's an incredibly safe sport, but it's like anything. There are some inherent dangers. Sure. So I went on, I got my advance, then I got my rescue. And on the, at the end of the first day of the rescue course, which once you take rescue, that's kind of the last thing you can do before you got to make the decision I'm done or I'm going to, become a professional, um, they ask, you know, who, who's interested in uh, becoming a dive master? And I mean, my hand shot right up. I, was, I knew instantly. <laughs> I was like, I want to work with people. And right. it's, it, it's easy to um, get excited about and sh- to share things when you're passionate about it. Oh, so, yeah. you know, fast forward now, like nine years later, I've, I'm, I'm now a master scuba diver trainer with Patty. Um, and then I also got into the tech side. So I do cave diving, rebreather, deep trimix, all that stuff. Wow. So full bore down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that's awesome. And, and, um, I'm where you were 10 years ago, I guess I've wanted to dive for a number of years and I spent a lot of time on a boat and I was thinking about it when we were in Florida last week is, you know, it'd be, it'd be a lot of fun to be out in the water right now, instead of sitting on the beach and, or even just, you know, fishing or being on a boat. There was a video that I was watching of a lady getting ready to dive and she's sitting, sitting on the platform and she sticks her face in the water and clears her mask. And all of a sudden she comes back up and, and a 
and a shark was like right in her face. Have you seen that video? I don't think so. It, it is yeah. wild. Like the shark just is right in her face and she just nonchalantly grabs it by the nose and like pushes it under the water and then she gets in. And I'm like, yeah. mm, I don't, I don't know. I probably would have uh, skipped that day. You know, it's weird. I've, I've dove, I've dove with sharks, uh, dove with tons of barracuda and you know, I'm always with barracuda. I always kind of have an eye on them to want to know where they're at. Yeah. Um, cause they're yeah. not afraid of you. They come cruising right up to yeah. you. Um, I've never felt the heebie jeebies from sharks at all. I've had, um, I've had them buzz by pretty close, but oddly enough, the thing that just makes my skin crawl underwater is eels. Mm. <laughs> like, when they yeah. uh, they get that mouth going open like that, and it's just I don't know, they just kind of give me the creeps. Yeah. We uh, yeah. in December I was we, we were in Bonaire um, in the Dutch Caribbean, and uh, my buddy I was diving with, he's like, "Hey, look over there!" And I look, and there's this big butter or uh, uh, got him blanking out on the name parrotfish. Okay, like oh yeah, okay. pretty big parrotfish. So I got real close and I got my GoPro and I'm getting real close on it. And I kind of look out the corner of my eye and he's shaking his head. He goes, which is a sign for an eel. And I look down and this thing's like right under my chin. Uh, it's like, Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I saw a video yesterday yeah, of a guy like petting a, um, a more, is it the moray eel? They're huge green. Yeah. It was, he yeah. was like petting it like a, like a dog. And I'm like, I think I saw that same video. He's like cuddling with yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I was waiting for the thing no. to like eat them. Yeah, no, they've got some big old nasty teeth. On yeah, them. but huh. yeah. yeah, I, I, I can't wait to do it. I, th- I think I'll have a lot of fun with it and be be a really yeah. cool activity. And there's there's places I boat a lot up at Erie, and there are some wrecks at, that you can dive on, um, which I think would be super cool. Um, cold. But you probably yeah. dive in a lot of cold, cold water. I I do. Um, you know, people, my students especially, will ask, you know, where I like to dive, and I, you know, kind of half jokingly but half serious say anywhere wet, right? Um, but being that I'm in the Midwest, you know, I'm based out of Kansas City. Yep. Um, if I want to dive year round, you gotta. I pretty much have to be able to dive all water temperatures. So. Um, I think the coldest I've ever been in is like 40 degree water. Yeah. Um, yeah. which definitely dry suit weather. Yeah. So for sure. Where's your favorite place that you've, you've ever dove? Uh, so you, for ocean diving, um, or open water, um, Bon Air is really high on the list. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with it, but there's basically that is, pretty much all that ex- island exists for is production of salt and scuba diving. Okay. And um, there's something like 80 dive sites there and it's all shore entry. Um, they call it the home of diving freedom because you literally, if you want to get up at three in the morning, grab some tanks and go hop in the water, nobody's going to stop you. Wow. And it's just incredibly beautiful, you know, turquoise blue, clear water. You can see, you can see the bottom 150 feet below you. I mean, just crazy and tons of coral, everything. Um, On the tech side of it, um, I really do enjoy going into caves Um, and people joke around about that and say, well, you know, all you're seeing is wet rocks, (laughs) which is true. But for me, what, what's enjoyable about it is the whole process because it's, it's, it's probably the closest you can get into going to outer space. Right. Right. Um, you're going in there. If something happens, you have to have every, the training, the equipment to get you back out. But the, the flip side of that is, is you're going into places that when you look at the, you know, the, the global population, like a extremely small percentage of humans ever get to put their eyes on. And, and I get excited about the fact that I'm seeing things that just not very many people get to see. Sure. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I'm not, I, I don't think I'm a big claustrophobic person, but it, I don't know how I would feel in in a space like that. It, it would take me a bit, yeah. I think. <laughs> I get that. I, I get that a lot, and I always tell people you don't have to put yourself in that situation unless you want to. Um, a lot of the caves we dive in, you could almost literally drive a truck. Through. Oh wow! Okay. Huge. 
I got you. I was, I was envisioning like a tight little wormhole. <laughs> well, you can do that too, yeah. <laughs> but it's, uh, that's it, not, not if you don't sure, want to. Sure. So. No, that's, that's super yeah. cool. But I, I was just surprised that I've known you this long and, and didn't know. I mean, that's a pretty big piece of your life. So I found that. Super well, I don't actually, yeah. And I don't actually, uh, physically fit the mold of what people think as a scuba diver either. Well, <laughs> fact, uh, I mean, do we six, six, yeah. four and 300 pounds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're a big boy. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, shoot. So, yeah. Very cool. Um, yeah. So I guess we'll, I guess jump back to, uh, the business piece of this a little bit more, but, um, give us a little bit of background, how you got into, the converting industry you've been with preco for a long time i mean you're on more of the the tech and and troubleshooting in for a majority of your time right yeah it's a great question that you ask that and that's one i ask people a lot too because in the converting world everybody's got a story how they got here right yeah because no no, 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 no kid when they were in first grade during career day, raised their hand and said, I want to be a die cutter. Right. You know, <laughs> it just doesn't happen. Yeah. And it, so, so I kind of fell into it as most people do. Um, uh, how I ended up here at Preco, my background, I got my degree in um, commercial graphics with an emphasis in screen printing. And so specifically functional screen printing, so printing circuits, printing um, solar cells, uh, EL displays, things like that. And Preco um, at the time uh, when I when I came here, they were building roll to roll vision registered screen printers to do just that. Um, and, and we were using our vision technology that we use on all of our equipment to register very, very precisely the ink passes. And so, you know, I'd, I'd been out of college for maybe four or five years. And I saw this job posting and, I, and I'd been out of college four or five years, basically working at a printed apparel screen printing shop. Not at all what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm didn't, as a college kid, didn't really think very far ahead of what am I going to do with the screen printing. And I'm going into something that's really pretty, uh, pretty niche uh, on the functional screen printing side. But anyway, I saw this ad for Preco and it was like pretty much exactly what I, my formal education had trained for. So sure. I'm going to go apply for that. And ended up getting the job and worked here for about a year uh, doing applications, technical work on our screen print stuff. So specking out equipment, doing installations, training, uh, process design, things like that. And about a year after I started here, uh, Preco had decided to start developing our rotary die cutters. And they came to me and they said, do you want to not, not only do the applications work on the screen print side, but are you interested in doing applications work on the rotaries as well? I'm not very good professionally at saying no when people ask me to do things. It's it it, it could be a fault or a positive yeah. one way or the other. But so I said, yeah, I'll do it. But I have zero experience. I don't even know what rotary die cutting is. Right. No problem. Learn on the learn on the fly. So I did that for about uh, seven years uh, doing applications on rotary die cutting. Same capacity as a screen printing, you know, specking out uh, systems, doing process development for people, um, training installations. And then uh, our flatbed equipment, uh, the guy that was doing applications on it, who had been doing it for 30 some years, his name is Randy Norman, and very well known in the converting industry uh, for for what he, his knowledge and and just being able to figure out uh, problems when it comes to converting. Uh, he decided he was going to retire uh, in four or five years. And so he kind of took me under his wing. And so I started doing applications work for, for all three at that point. And I did that for about 14 years, um, just working on the, the tech side. I, I was out of our engineering group 
doing some some little bit of design work, mostly process stuff, mostly training. Uh, did did some consulting work for customers, and then in 2001, uh, there was an opportunity that opened up uh, to step into a sales role, and I was approached by our our sales uh, uh, director of sales at that point. And he asked me if I wanted to step over into sales. Um, and again, not real great at saying no professionally. I uh, was nervous as hell. Right. But uh, right. I knew that I knew all of our equipment inside and out. So I decided to take that step and and then realize what, what real work is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I joke around with all our other sales guys here. And I said, you know, I used to walk by your guy's office and I'd see you staring at your computer all day. I thought you guys were just screwing off on the internet. I had no idea you were really working. <laughs> it's like, but uh, I've loved every minute of it. It's been um, absolutely the best career move I've ever, I, ever made in my life. And I think I finally found where I can settle in yeah. and, and, you know, I, I get the opportunity to, continue to help people and coach people. And now I have a lot more freedom in it than, than I did before. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I really, really enjoy that side of it. Yeah. Yeah. But I, yeah, all total been here about 17 years. I think I'm starting my 17th year this July. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Congrats on that. Institutionalized. I don't think I can go to any other industry now. No, no, you're stuck. <laughs> yeah. I don't think they're letting you leave at this point. <laughs> yeah but that and, and, well, there's probably yeah. there's probably days that i wish i would yeah well yeah I, there's days that people wish i would quit too so <laughs> yeah. I, I think they're stuck with me though <laughs> yeah they don't have a choice right yeah i i had similar experience before you know we had our little blip there we were talking about um you know getting into converting uh by accident and and mcmillan co totally got in to converting by accident. And it was really, uh, we were, we were helping a company develop a product and we found a company that could do all processes except for the sheeting piece that we needed to do for them. And Connor ran across you guys. And, um, I, I believe the machine that we ended up purchasing was, was a 3M machine that you sold to 3M for a project and then that project died. So they sold it back to you. Um, but Connor came into my office and he was like, Hey, I found this machine that can do everything. And I'm like, eh, I don't, I don't know that I want to buy a machine to run one pro, you know, this one customer on. Um, but we looked at the numbers and it made sense. And long story short, we ended up buying the machine and knew, I didn't even know what the hell converting was when we, when we bought the machine and we've had it now for four years, I think. And it was, you know, we got it, we got it in, uh, Steve came out, helped us get it set up and we were running product, you know, that same day. And unfortunately the customer that we bought the machine for went out of business within a year. Um, but we just made the decision just to keep it and, and, you know, figure it out. And, and yeah. so far it's, it's worked. It's been challenging, especially not, you know, never being in the industry before. It's not like I had a, a deep network of customers that needed uh, needed converting work. So it's been, especially on the sales end of things for me, it's been a rewarding challenge to take something that, you know, I, I didn't know anything about and build a business out of it. Yeah, you know, and, and I just talking about McMillan Co., um, the, when, when you guys purchase that system, you know, I always do a little bit, just kind of web search and try to learn a little bit about the company. And I was just floored, especially the first time they came out to your facility, at how diverse you guys are. Yeah. Um, which is really, really cool. And it seems like everything you do, you do really well. Um, on the converting side, um, you know, one of the one of the feathers in that cap is is that most people don't realize how diverse the converting industry is. And when yeah. I say that, I mean, just about every, you turn your head 360 and look around your room, 
I can go around and, and just start picking up parts and say, this has got a die cut part. This has got a die cut part. Right. That's got a die cut part. Yep. And literally everything around us from, you know, the, the, the little CR80 coupons you get in the mail all the way to components floating on the satellites above us all have something in it that a converter made. Right. Right. Yeah. And just everything. And that was a learning curve for me because I had no idea. Now I could walk into a factory and I could pick out all the machine parts, all the four slide stamping parts, all the springs, the castings, what kind of casting it is. Um, look at a casting and tell if there was a problem with it. Uh, so that was something that, you know, just my own tribal knowledge that I, you know, learned over the years. And then I get into this converting thing and I knew nothing about, I'm still learning every single day, um, you know, what pieces and what parts we can make and we can't make. Um, and a lot of it's just having the confidence that we can. I, I know when we, you know, made the foil, um, that copper foil product, a lot of people told us that that's just not possible. You can't cut, you know, you can't kiss cut something that's four mil thick. And Scott at the time, uh, was like, Oh, we can, we can do that all day long. I'm like, okay, I have to have confidence that we can do it. I, I think Connor and, um, and Brendan flew out and spent a couple of days mm-hmm. with you guys and, and he trained them and we uh, sent product out there and he helped them run it on, on our machine now. And, you know, Connor calls me, he's like, it can do everything we need it to do, which was a huge confidence builder, not knowing what we yeah. were getting into, uh, that you guys had the whole machine set up at your facility and taught and showed us that it would, that it would work. And it's like, okay, well let's, you know, let's roll with it then. Yeah. You know, when a, a capital equipment investment is not nothing to, nothing to turn a shoulder to. Right. So yeah. you gotta, you gotta make sure that you're confident in it yeah. and that it's going to work for you. Yeah. yeah. And, Absolutely. And, I mean, some companies, you know, what we spent on that machine, it, it probably isn't a big deal to them, but for us, especially at that time, it was a monster investment. I, I mean, I had never bought anything that expensive in my life except for a home. And, you know, it was, I'm like, you know, it was a leap of faith that we would make it work. So, yeah. but again, well, without you guys, I don't think we would have been able to, if we would have bought the machine from, you know, China or something, we, we would have never made it work. Yeah. Well, and you know, we've, again, we've been building the, the system you bought, which was a flatbed die cutter. Yep. You know, we built flatbeds, rotaries and lasers. Uh, we've been building a flatbed since 1976. Yeah. Um, and now that I'm on the sales side, I uh, realized that, that I wish they wouldn't have been built so well because <laughs> they don't ever, <laughs> they don't ever fade out. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, they are a, a pretty big investment, but when you get a good job on them, you know, they only cost, they only cost money until you turn them on. Yep. And then they start producing it. Yeah. And that's the thing for ours. I mean, we, you know, we paid for it with one, one job and yeah. which was huge. Um, you know, there's not a lot of machines that you can say, okay, we have, you know, less than a, a year ROI, let along a, a month or two. Um, you know, there's, I know guys that are buying machinery that it takes them five years to pay the thing off. And that, that scares the hell out of me. Yeah. Well, and I think it, it ties in too, it's a little bit, uh, or, or it is a credit to McMillan Co. You, you know, kind of going back to what you told me about we're going to go after the stuff nobody else wants. Um, that's a huge value add, right? Yeah. And when you're willing to be the person to step up and say, "Yeah, I'm going to do it," um, that that gives you a, a, a pretty good um, a leverage point and and lets you lets you really attack things. Yeah, and we was- we've won business and, and what gives us that confidence is is coming to you and say hey we have an opportunity to do this is the machine capable of doing it and you guys go yep and i, I go back and 100 percent confidence yes we can do this we can hold the tolerance we can hit the rate we can you know do whatever they're asking and what we've done a couple of times is we've had customers say hey we've we've been trying to make this part for three years we cannot hold tolerance we haven't found anyone that can hold tolerance you're saying that we can, we don't want to invest in the tooling. You know, what if you can't do it? And, and that's a really easy conversation for me is I say, okay, well, 
I'll buy the tooling. We'll prove that we can make it. And once you approve, you know, the first article, then you pay for the tooling. If, if we can't ever hit the, you know, hit the uh, dimensional requirements, then, you know, I eat the tooling. And yeah. I mean, for a customer that just, I mean, why would they say no to that? And we, sure. we've done that a few times and, and uh, it's, it's worked out well. And we, and we have had challenges. I mean, one part was like this little foam disc that we were doing. And I never thought that, you know, the static involved in it. And we had these, you know, millions of pieces stuck all over the damn machine and we're calling you for help and, you know, trying to figure out how to, how to get the static out and, you know, how to get the parts in the box and not everywhere. Yeah. Um, but that's the fun part too. And it's rewarding for our team uh, because they have a huge sense of accomplishment once they, you know, once they get it figured out and once it's running well and, and things like that. So. Yeah, for sure. But, what, uh, if you don't mind me asking, what are some of the tolerances that you find you're being asked to hold these days? Um, the one project was, was the, the military card. And if I remember it, it was like in the machining world, it's wide open. Right. But, um, I yeah. think it was plus or minus 30 thou. And we, we could hit that all day long. And we, um, it, it took us a little bit to, to get the target. Um, it took us a little bit to get the, the, uh, material to feed through, <clears throat> but that was mainly a material issue because there wasn't enough material on the back side of the machine. Um, there's plenty of material on the front side of the machine, but the back side they were, they cut it really close to, you know, like the bleed line and we were getting some issues with the, you know, the, the material walking. Um, yeah. but once we got that figured out and we just stopped running the, the material that was bad, um, we, I mean, our scrap weight was phenomenal. We yeah. made a little go, no go gauge because we were trying to measure everything and we just made this little, um, 3d printed go, no go gauge where, you know, our folks could put, put the piece in there, they closed it. And if it, you know, if it was good, it was good. If it was bad, it was bad. Um, and we didn't have, we didn't have any parts rejected. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I like to talk to her when I, when I'm talking to people a lot, you know, kind of in similar situations like that, where maybe they're not doing the entire process in house, you know, maybe, maybe somebody else is printing it and then it comes to them and they're just converting it and it goes mm -hmm. down the line. Yep. Uh, you really have to keep all of those lines of communication open, right. From one end of the line to the other. Yep. Uh, I, I, I always like to kind of joke around and say, it's kind of like the, 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 the framing carpenter comes in and frames it and says, well, now, it, now it's the, the drywall guy's problem. And then the drywall guy comes in and he says, well, now it's the trim guy's problem. Exactly. And you, you really gotta, you really gotta keep that open front to front to back because, uh, the, the, the guy that's doing the printing may not fully understand what you're going to need on your end. And, and you may not fully understand what the next step down the line is going to need. It just makes things move so much smoother. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and that was a learning curve for us, especially on that project was um, when we received all the material, it was, it was wound backwards. It was on the wrong size core. Um, and we had all those notes on the drawing, but it, for whatever reason it was missed. So that was a learning curve between us and the printer, uh, not having enough material on the backside. That was, you know, it's something that we understood with the customer, but that it wasn't clear on the drawing, you know, so we, you know, modified some notes and things that we learned and it, there's some tribal knowledge there. And, and the printer was awesome. I mean, they, um, they took responsibility for what they needed to take responsibility for. And we were able to get, get it rewound on the right size core. And, um, and the next time we, you know, we get the material, it'll be printed properly. Uh, and I'm sure our scrap rate will go down even more. Um, I did just yeah. pull up another drawing cause I knew, I thought that there was something that little foam disc was, um, the center hole was plus or minus 20 thou. So it was even, okay. even tighter. And we, 
we could hit that so well that they changed the tolerance because they didn't expect that we were able to hold that. And we, we were so dead nuts on that. They're like, okay, we have to, you know, we have to change the tolerance because you can hold it so well. Um, so we, that that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And kudos to the die maker and, and, uh, engineering for, for figuring that out and, and holding those tolerances. So. Well, and you, and you know what, uh, de facto too, you kind of just solidified that they can't go anywhere else because they're, they're going to go with their new drawing. They're like, we can't do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Come right back. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. It's same thing with the military project that we're doing. Um, you know, with the amount that we saved, I, you know, I, I get to their facility and they have these red tubs sitting everywhere. And I'm like, yeah. oh, red tubs are never, never good. <laughs> I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of pieces in these red tubs. And... I'm like, is this all quarantine stuff? And they're like, all of it's our tolerance. And I'm like, wow. I, you know, I'm like, hopefully I didn't bite off something we, we can't chew. So that, that made me a little nervous going in there. We, you know, I hand delivered the first articles to him because we, we got material like six months later than what we should have. And, um, you know, all those things. Thank goodness that wasn't on, you know, on our end, we, yeah. our responsibility, but um yeah it's 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 fun when you can do do jobs like that so on the on the static on those foam parts what did you all end up doing to combat the static we ended up grounding something with copper wire um it's been three years ago i can't remember exactly what we did but i believe that we ended up grounding the the press section and I believe, I think it was just the, the press section, maybe the rollers. Um, I think there was some static being caused there. So we had to ground the, the feed roller and the press and maybe something else. I, I, w- I was just curious because static is always, you know, I don't want to say always, but it, man, when it rears its ugly head, it is it is a, it is a real booger to deal with. Yeah. And you know, a lot of times uh, I'll, I'll try to help and advise where I can, yeah. but what I see static wise here in Kansas city in July in our climate controlled building, I could have it running perfectly here, but the moment I send it to, you know, customer X out in Arizona in the desert in December, yeah. everything I did just went out the window. Oh, hundred percent. Like, yeah. It, it, it's like, it has to, you, you really have to address those issues right there. Yeah. Um, and I, I always recommend people bring out, a, you know, a static expert. Um, to me, static is kind of like voodoo. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah. You, you just start trying to figure it out, dump some chicken blood over it and throw some bones on a plate. Yeah. That's not true. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but um, there, there's a higher level of understanding there than what I have. Um, so I always recommend, um, that, that you try to address, if you have static issues, you really need to, if they're bad, I mean, there's easy ones you can address, but if you have bad static issues with materials, uh, to bring in a static expert and address it right there at the point. Right. Yeah. And I, I think that's what we'll have to do next time because I don't even know if we a hundred percent got it, got it figured out. And then it was a new, a new product that this medical company was doing and it, it ended up not taking off. Uh, so I think we got it figured out well enough to, to deliver. Um, but we, we weren't running big production where we, you know, we had to go down that path, but we probably would have had to bring in an expert, um, just because we, we didn't get rid of it a hundred percent. Yeah. And sometimes you can't. Yeah. I, I remember years back, this was when we were still doing the screen printers, uh, we were, we built a system that was making RFID tags um, actually for, I believe it was for the tickets for the Beijing Olympics. Oh, wow. And part of the process was this, this PET material got drug across a cooling plate. We well, got plastic dragging across this metal plate, mm. you know, mm-hmm. however many hundreds of times per, per hour and then rewinding onto this roll and, it was a clear roll with with circuits printed on it, but you can you can stand at the back and you can see like little lightning bolts running through it. Oh wow! It's like 
Oh my God, that thing has such a huge charge built on it. And um, yeah, just, and then also kind of getting a giggle when you'd see somebody else in the shop walking by and they go, go over and they start to put their hand on it. Yeah. Oops, you're zap. about to get a good zap. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. But uh, yeah. yeah. I don't think we Static, have any lightning uh, bolts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, kind of going back to my, my days uh, before pre preco, uh, when I was in the, the that apparel company, they did a lot of cut and sew, and they would pull uh, polyester back and forth on these cut tables, and they had a metal rail, you know, right about thigh high on it. And man, that would build such a big charge. Oh, and you walk by and it, it'd zap you. Yeah. No, that's it, the static. It, it did blow my mind because I didn't even think about static being an issue. And I walk out and there's. A, just these little, you know, they're that big, yeah. uh, point half an inch in diameter and they're just stuck yeah. everywhere. And I'm like, what in the hell is going on here? And guys well, have you know, stuck and, all over their arms. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, you, you, you're running it in December. Yeah. You've got terrible static issues and you come back in July when it's hot and humid and all of a sudden it runs fine. Yeah. It's just, it, it's so, so temperamental. Yeah. And it, it's yeah. so interesting how material reacts, uh, to temperature change or humidity or barometric pressure, uh, years and years and years ago, I, I worked for a company that we did deep draw metal forming and we would, we were doing different military projects and this one project that we were doing, it was a, a cylinder that was approximately four feet in diameter had different wall thicknesses throughout, um, it was a very difficult part to make. And when we were deep drawing it, we were turning the thing inside out and we had to anneal it and, you know, do all these things. And in the winter, we would have to um, set the standard deviation of the tolerances differently than we would in the summer uh, because the, even though it measured appropriately in our shop, when it got to the customer, by the time it traveled on a truck in the cold, it would shrink and it would be out of tolerance. And it was, you know, our metal or just at the time, we're like, what in the hell is going on? But the tolerances were so, t you know, so tight uh, that it just changed everything. So you would, you'd have to make the thing out of tolerance, ship it, and then it would be in tolerance by the time it got to, you know, the final facility. I and mean, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, kind of a, a similar story that we had a project years back um, where we were cutting. Um, you remember when the 50 state coins came out? Yeah. They had different different quarter for every state. We were cutting these. Uh, we had a customer that was cutting these cards that you could put all the coins in. And it was a, probably about an eighth to three sixteenths inch thick um, uh, foam core with a, a bonded layer on the outside that had printing on it. Okay. And all we were doing was cutting the holes for the quarters. What they found out was, is uh, when they shipped them by air and you got in that low pressure environment that the material expanded because it was a closed cell mm -hmm. and it expanded so much that it made all the ink pop off. Holy crap. And, and it was crazy. So they had to, um, they had to switch the foam um, and there for a while had to have a caveat on it that you can't ship it by air. Yeah. Interesting. Really interesting. Yeah, we're yeah. we're working on a project. It's it's a new product that this guy's developing in the fishing industry, and we're we're trying to do something that we certainly haven't done before. And it's a die cut, you know, on the perimeter, and then we're kiss cutting within the die cut. Only you know we're trying to go halfway through the foam, and mm -hmm. we're running into issues where some of the some of the cuts will be deeper than the other parts. You know, the other cuts just because of the nature of the material is it just, you know, splits differently, I guess. So we're evaluating different, different types of foams and, and all kinds of things. And, and the die maker they're they were running tests on a, on a clicker press. So I I'm hoping that when we get it in, we, you know, we have much, much more control of the depth. So hopefully that'll solve a lot of, a lot of problems, but uh, it's a challenging yeah that's a challenging part that we're doing right now. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And it, it is, I, you know, I'm a big fisherman, so I, I kind of took that on personally <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to yeah. try and try and figure out and, 
and uh that project we're not going to make money on for a long time but uh but, but are you going to be doing product testing yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah we will so yeah. it'll it'll be fun and rewarding once we do figure it out and and that yeah. so yeah that's super cool yeah yeah, yeah. we've we've had a, a couple projects in the outdoor world kind of fishing i know we had one it was a a, a foam fishing lure but the idea on the foam was is that it got the the fish's teeth would get tangled in it mm. so that they could uh, even if you didn't get a hook set you right. still had a good chance of landing it was that for its war or what kind of fish was it you... uh yeah i'm not sure what what species they were exactly targeting right it's not gonna work for like bass or crappie or anything like right. that but um but it, it was interesting we we're just cutting the shapes you know the the shad and the worms and things like that huh. That is interesting. I wonder if it was for guar because we would, we would fish for guar with um, pantyhose, white pantyhose, yeah. and that was it. There's no hook, no nothing, and yeah. we'd fly fish for them, and they would they would hit that pantyhose, and their teeth would get tangled in the pantyhose, and that's how we caught them. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a hell of a fight on a fly rod too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah those things are freshwater barracuda. I mean, they're yeah. they're yeah. wild. Yeah, but um, what a what do you see in the converting world in the EV industry? The EV industry is, you know, the big hot topic buzzword, you know, I know yep. Ohio, uh, in manufacturing, Ohio is one of the, you know, the biggest manufacturing arms in, in the U S uh, there's mm-hmm. a lot of push for the EV and PCB boards, um, aerospace. I mean, those are the three, you know, the three big industries that, uh, that we're being pushed towards, especially, um, what are you guys seeing on your end? Um, yeah, so that specifically that industry is one that I've been, I've been targeting, been working a lot in, um, EV batteries, hydrogen, uh, fuel cells and hydrogen electrolyzers. Yeah. Um, it is very fast moving Yep. there. The, everybody has their own design. There's no standardization in it. Right. So you've got the, you got the big three automakers that are working on their own pack designs. You've got uh, independent companies working on pack designs from the converting side of it. What a lot of people, um, are starting to learn, uh, what I, what I'm pushing people for is, Hey, learn how these packs are made. There is a boatload of components, even in a single prismatic cell that have to be die cut. Mm -hmm. You've got, you've got the electrodes, uh, both cathode nanodes, you've got separator layers, You've got um, thermal management, so chimerics and things like aerogels for for thermal runaway. Then you've got all the gasketing inside of it, too. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a ton, and there's so many people doing it. There's a lot of opportunity there. Kind of not laughably, but the the part that that I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it. Uh, and I don't want to call it the gotcha, but the one thing that I, I advise people to kind of be aware of too is a lot of these companies that are coming up with these designs um, are rushing into manufacturing before the designs are complete. Mm. So you can imagine on the converting side, you're trying to tool up and get set to make this stuff, and you're you've got a you know ever evolving, changing product that you're trying to tool up for. Sure. Um, so so. You know, I always advise people really kind of be aware of that. That's probably going to happen. Um, but the the sheer volume um, in those components that need to be produced, I mean, if you take a, a prismatic cell or prismatic battery, there's can be up to 52 monocells inside of it. And of those 52 monocells, you've got, three components in each monocell that potentially could be die cut. Right. So you're a hundred, you know, what's that put you to a hundred and a hundred and six die cut parts per prismatic pack. And there could be, you know, in an EV, you could have a hundred or more of those prismatic packs in there. So you start extrapolating those numbers out and Holy crap. Yeah, that is a lot of parts that need to be die cut. And that's what everybody's rushing to now is how can we produce these parts at a rate that will keep up with the the projected demands Mm -hmm. and 
to, I don't think personally, I don't think any of the OEMs are going to get there on their own without investing mega dollars into doing these gigawatt and factories and things like that. Um, they're going to have to look to outside converters to help support that. Yeah. Yeah. We were, I mean, we're excited about it. Uh, we've had a few companies contact us that are overseas that are wanting to make batteries here. And it's really, you know, they sent us um, presentations of what needs cut and the, and the layers. So we're able to laminate, you know, five or seven layers on, on the front end, uh, which is something unique that you guys have told us that we're set up that not many people are to, to laminate and run right into the press section. Um, so we're, we're able to do that. The only part that we're not able to do that I saw is the, um, any, any wet coating on the front end. So that's something yeah. that we would have to figure out. I don't know if we can do that in line or not, or if we'd have to laminate everything and then set up a separate operation uh, to do the wet coating or, or how that would work yet. Yeah, you, you can add wet coating in line. Um, it, it, it's definitely doable. Um, the, uh, and that's, you know, that's the other aspect of it too, is it's not really just the die cutting on the conveyors, like you said, the lamination of those, um, the slot coating, and, you know, and, and I'm, I don't know any specifics about that product, but a lot of, a lot of electrodes, they will take a, um, either a copper or an aluminum foil, usually around four thousandths thick, and then slot coat the, the soup, you know, the electrode material onto it that, mm -hmm. uh, and, and place that on it. Um, fundamentally the converting side of these, uh, these components for battery and the EV, nothing too complex. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, gen they generally want higher tolerances though. Um, and, and really the, the biggest challenge on it is just the sheer volumes they want. Yeah. They're, they're looking for enormous, enormous volumes in a short order. Yeah. Um, we, we quoted a project for, it was an ag project and it, the volumes were um, 100 million up to 200 million. And with our rate, I want to say we could, we could keep up with that pretty easily. We would have to run, you know, three shifts uh, yeah. to make sure that we had enough capacity for everything else. But I think we could deliver what their monthly needs were with running a week at a time. We'd have to yeah. set up, run for a week and, and ship and, and do that each month but um i was really when they told me the volumes i'm like i don't even, is this possible and we started yeah. running the numbers and and we could we could easily keep up with it so i, I was pretty yeah. impressed with with that yeah um you know in in that the what i'll call the green energy move the for converters too um that i don't think a lot of people are looking at but they should is the hydrogen industry, both the hydrogen um, uh, fuel cell and the electrolyzer. Right. For all intents and purposes, they're the really kind of the same device. Just one takes hydrogen and turns it into water and electricity. The other one takes water and electricity and turns it into hydrogen. Right. Uh, but the, at the component level on those, typically what we see is that uh, – the tolerances are a little bit more relaxed than what you find in the in the battery market, and the volumes are are more manageable. But the uh, the price you can command on these parts is a lot higher. Yeah. So on the converting side, um, tends to be a little bit uh, lower hanging fruit, um, and that that is a market we see growing quite a bit as well. Interesting. So when when you talk about tight tolerances and the converting. Uh, industry. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit because tight tolerances is, you know, you're in the aerospace machining, you're, we could be talking about microns, um, right. which is a whole hell of a lot different than tight tolerance in the converting industry. What, what kind of tolerances are you guys able to hit um, either rotary or, and, or um, the flatbed? Yeah. So I'll kind of, uh, I'll address it a little bit more globally and then I can break out the different different systems. Cause if you look at if you look at rotary and laser and flatbed and you were to draw them up in a Venn diagram, there's a lot of overlap. 
You know, they, there's a lot of things they can all do. Um, but there's, there's absolutely sections where they shine over the other. In general, um, what, what we would consider um, to be a tight tolerance would be something in the plus or minus, like an extremely tight tolerance for converting uh, would be something in the plus or minus one or two thousandths of an inch uh, dimensional tolerance. If we were looking at uh, cut to cut to feature, like a registration, um, we're, we're capable of going down to uh, the micron level um, on a system if we if we had to. Granted, that's a that's a custom system, um, not off the shelf, but we've done it mm -hmm. uh, and, and it can be done. Typically, what we see, what what I would say is the lion's share. Of, of tight tolerance jobs is in that plus or minus five thousandths of an inch. Now, when we look at it, if we want to look at it as a, a you know, kind of rotary versus flatbed versus laser, you know, laser and, and, and flatbed are going to be the most accurate simply because they operate in a step and re repeat uh, function, mm -hmm. whereas the material stationary when we cut it. Right. And the, the die is coming down and it's completely plunging through the material at the same time. So really the tolerance, I don't want to say completely, but largely is, is tied into the die at that point. Um, not completely because we do have to control the material tension and things like that. You know, using the analogy, if you cut a rubber band and the, the, the rubber is under tension, it's a circle when you cut it, but the moment it releases from that tension, it becomes an oval, right? Right. And has memory on, on the rotary side. Um, it's very accurate. We can hold on the high accuracy side. We can get to that plus or minus five thousandths of an inch. Five to ten is what we'd call the high accuracy, five thousandths to ten thousandths inch. The reason it can't quite hold quite as well as laser or flatbed is because it's operating on continuous motion. So it's based on the principle that you've got this material going by and you got the die rolling over the top of it. Right. Those dies are machined to incredible tolerances, you know, half thousandths of an inch plus or minus. But the problem is, is that that, that material is moving even a fraction faster or slower. That affects your down web dimension on the part. And you're never, ever going to be able to guarantee that that die is truly turning at a one to one ratio with the material. Mm -hmm. So you're always going to have a little bit more variance there. And then, you know, on tolerancing too, and this is something I know you're, you're wholly aware of as a converter, material plays a huge part in the tolerance as well, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, uh, we, get, we will have people that show up and say, hey, I've got this 16th, 16th inch thick, ultra low density open cell foam. We, we want to hold plus or minus five thousandths on it. Hmm, I mean, I can cut that tight, but not with that material. Right. You know, it's just not going to happen. Right. So, yeah. And, and the depth uh, that really blew me away for the kiss cutting purposes, the depth that we can hold, it, it was astonishing to me that we're able to hold, you know, fractions of a hundred thou, um, which kudos to you guys. I think that uh, Preco's the only machine maker that can do that, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I, I, I don't. I won't say we're the only people out there that can kiss cut. I will say we're the only people out there that can kiss cut to the resolution we can. Um, I've never seen another uh, piece of equipment with a micrometer stop. And when I say a micrometer, it is an actual micrometer. It yep. looks like a giant machinist micrometer. Yep. And you can dial that depth of cut in, like you said, within a few tenths. Yeah. Um, it allows us to have to do kiss cutting on very fine liners that other people can't. And it, you, you mentioned earlier that uh, you had a die maker tell you that, or a customer say it's not possible to kiss cut on that material. We hear that all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I, I did, we had a customer, this is probably two or three years ago, come in and they were, I have no idea what the product was, but it, it was a piece, a really thin piece of glass that had yeah. a plastic laminate on top of it. And they said, can we kiss cut this laminate to the glass? And I, I, 
I kind of started laughing and I said, I have no idea, but I want to try it. Yeah. You know, give, yeah. give me a piece. Let's sure. start in there. And yeah. we did. And the moment I realized, I was like, holy crap. I I looked at uh, one of our other sales guys and I said, this, this is an awesome demo. So I went and I got on Amazon. I ordered some eight by 10 picture frames and took the glass out just straight, you know, flat glass. And we, we, we started doing demos and I'd put material in, set the press to 40 tons and then say, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kiss cut the material first without breaking the glass. Then I'm going to adjust that micrometer stop by the thickness of the paper. And I'm going to do another kit and I'm going to through cut it, but I'm not going to break the glass. Right. And we can do it all day long. Yeah. Uh, and then, then of course, one of the times that I'm showing somebody this, and I always take the glass out and break it with a hammer to show that it was really glass. Right. I had an Elon Musk moment where I hit it and it didn't break. They're <laughs> real bad. I'm like, oh, of course not. <laughs> <There we go. laughs> I think he was demonstrating how tough the glass was on the, yeah, the side of the truck. Yeah. yeah. He says you can't break it. And he hits it and it just shatters. Yeah. It was the opposite way for me. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that I'm sure you guys have a video out there of that. We'll have to uh, put a link to that in the in our yeah bio yeah. Or whatever. There's one on YouTube. Yeah. They, I yeah. There's a lot of videos, and I, I am in a lot of them. I have no idea why. I keep telling everybody, I was like, I don't know why this is the face they chose. <laughs> <laughs> well, I we we posted a very simple video that I just shot on my on my cell phone and posted on LinkedIn and Scott called me and he like within minutes of me posting this video, it was like, it wasn't edited or, or anything. And he's like, he goes, do you, do you know how many calls I've gotten from that <laughs> video? And I'm like, yeah. I have no idea. I just thought it was impressive that, you know, what we were doing, we could do And He's like, he goes, nobody else would dare to post something like that. And I'm no. like, why? And he's like, well, because one, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to, you know, give away any secrets. I'm like, well, I don't think we're giving away anything. We're showing that we can, we can do yeah. it. It took us a little bit to get there, but, um, it, that was kind of an aha moment for me, you know, to get a call from Scott and, yeah. and, uh, you know, well, I, I, that I, video, I guess. I remember it was probably seconds after he called you, my phone blows up. He's like, you gotta check the video out. <laughs> it yeah. was fantastic. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And it, in, it is just a testimony to the machine and it was very repeatable. Um, once we got set up, I think we had some, a learning curve to get the, uh, the scrap matrix to pull off without breaking. And it was just, you know, trial and error and, and we figured it out and documented it and we could set up and do it, you know, anytime now, but, um, yeah. Well, yeah, you know, it's always an interesting position. I've, I've run into a few of our customers through the years that have that, uh, mentality of, I don't need to be secretive about everything I do because if I can't win the business, I can't win the business, right? Right. And um, I, to me personally, I think it's a, I think it's a, a, a pretty, pretty good demonstration of the faith you have in your company and what you're doing. If you say, mm -hmm. "Hey, look at this. This is what we can do for you." Sure. Right? And, and I think if somebody's in the position that you know they're gonna you know, come to Preco and buy their own machine and that makes sense, then, you know, we're only going to keep that business for so long anyways. Right. I mean, the ROI is there and, and, yeah. you know, why not? Um, you know, we want to help the people out that, that need help. And if, and if we, you know, run a project for a company for, you know, X amount of time and, and they end up, you know, going and buying one of your machines, that's, you know, awesome. You know, good for yeah. them. I mean, we, we did the same thing uh, because we were told that, you know, we couldn't do a certain process or they didn't have the capability. And, and I mean, that's just the way, way things go. And if, if that's what happens, that, that happens. I mean, we're, we want to work with people that, that need help and want help and we solve a problem for them and hopefully we work with them for a lifetime. But uh, yeah. if that's not what happens and that's okay too, I mean, we've, we've reached out, you know, especially in the beginning days, um, just to help fill capacity on the machine because we had, you know, so much, um, just contacting other converters and saying, Hey, if you have any overflow work, we would, 
we would love to help you out. We'll sign an NDA. We'll do, do whatever. We're never going to go after the customer, but, um, we would love to be able just to help and fill some of our capacity. And, and, uh, it was kind of shocking to me how closed lip the converting industry is where they're like, absolutely not. We would never do this. Um, and in the, you know, the fab world and the machining world, it's like all the, all these guys, they help each other out and, and all that. So that was a little, little different to me. Um, we quoted a couple jobs for a, for a giant converter and we were, we were able to run both products more efficiently than them. Um, we could sell it to them, make, make our margin and they, they had less in it than if they were able, if they were running it in house. Oh, wow. And their, uh, engineers wanted to do it because they were just tired, tired of fighting it. And upper management said, absolutely not. If this little company can figure it out, we're going to figure it out. So, you know, that was kind of a, you know, I was disappointed that we didn't win the business, but I, it was kind of a proud moment too. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I, I will say, you know, again, like converting is so diverse. Uh, there are subsects of the, or sex of the uh, converting industry that um, they are a little bit more communal helping. I know mm-hmm. the, the gasket side of things, the, the gasket converters are, are very, uh, I don't want to say communal, but they're very open to helping each other out um, and they'll run jobs for each other. Uh, yeah. There's, you know, there's only so many ways you can make a gasket. So there's not a whole lot of proprietary stuff going on there. Sure. But yeah, sure. um, sure. You know that's one industry where they're 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 very much open arm and willing to help, um, but yeah, the the general converting guys, um, they tend to get a little closed lip because sometimes those guys are doing well as you know. I mean, you're in that world too. Some of those projects come through are, are pretty high tech, cutting edge stuff, right? Yeah, yeah or it's going to end up in something like that, and um, yeah, you know. yeah. I, I don't know. I, I like it. We enjoy it internally. We, we have a lot of fun with it and, and it's definitely a piece of our business that we're um, putting a lot of energy into to grow. Um, I think within the next year or so, we will be looking to acquire a converter. Um, so if anyone's listening to this <laughs> and you're wanting to retire, I, I there's a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, baby boomers out there that are, that are in that position where um, they're ready to go to Florida and, you know, do retirement things. So definitely interested in that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I can agree. I'm not a baby boomer, but I'm ready to go to Florida and do retirement things too. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> it made, it made me realize that even more when we were there yesterday and we get, you know, we get back late last night. We probably got back at two in the morning and it didn't, surprisingly it wasn't freezing but I think tomorrow it's going to be pretty damn cold here. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. I'm I'm ready to spend more time down there as well. But yeah, whereabouts in Florida were you? Uh, Melbourne, uh, India Atlantic specifically. Okay, so, cool. Yeah, cool. on the like just south of Cogo Beach. So it was pretty cool. We got to yeah. we got to see um, one rocket launch. Um, oh, awesome. I think there were three total while we were down there. One we were sitting at dinner and the there's so much cloud cover you couldn't see it but we were we were in cocoa beach eating dinner and you could feel it like you could just feel like the whole building's rumbling uh, like holy cow that is freaking awesome i'm um, super yeah. jealous that's yeah, one thing i've always wanted to see yeah it is cool we we missed one they delayed it and we were out on the beach in cocoa and um we were ready to watch it and then we got a notification we have this app um that said, Hey, it's been delayed an hour. So we're like, okay, well let's, the girls wanted to go to Ron John's and, you know, buy some sweaters and things like that. And we were going to kill time. And then all of a sudden you hear, you hear the rocket go off and you can feel oh. like, all, and we're like, damn it. We, so we missed that one. Um, and it was clear. It would have been awesome as that night, which I hear that, you know, the rocket launches at night are just incredible, especially that close. So, but yeah. they do a lot of them. I mean, they're, I think there were at least four in uh, Cape Canaveral and um, the other, they're all in the same general vicinity, um, Kennedy Space Center. Uh, There were probably four last week. And then California, SpaceX, you know, they did a few. 
Um, it, it's amazing how many of those launches are going off. Yeah. You think when we were kids, there was like maybe one a year or two a year or something. Now it's, you know, they're, they're shooting, you know, four or five a week. Yeah. So. Well, and, you know, I guarantee you on every one of those rockets, there was components that were converted and yeah. I would, I can't guarantee it, but I bet folding money that there were parts that were cut on a Preco press. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. Even the, uh, you know, because there's a lot of satellites on a lot of those rockets that, you know, they're unmanned, they're shooting the rocket off, they're releasing satellites and then, and then yeah. coming back. So there's a lot yeah. of, a lot of parts cut on both of those. I, I know you guys have sold to NASA. Um, you know, the, I, quite a few machines to NASA, haven't you? I don't know about NASA particular. Okay. Um, I was, yeah. Yeah. I was I, thinking there I was a project at one time we were I, talking about. Yeah. I don't know full, full I, I'd have to go back and look. I don't know. We, you know, we've, we're with so many different industries and companies. I don't know about NASA specifically, Okay, but I'd have to, I'd have to go back and look on that. Um, but yeah. You know, it, it's interesting. I talked to a guy you're going back to the ga gasket industry. I was down at the uh, gasket fabricator show in Orlando two weeks ago. And I was talking to a guy that had a gasket company in, uh, well, you want to talk about kind of middle of the nowhere. He was up near, um, ugh, blanking out way up in the Northeast of Canada. Oh, wow. Way up, way up there. And, um, but he does like really custom, almost one off gaskets. He was telling me it's not uncommon for him to sell a single gasket for like $2,800. Wow. It's like, woof. Yeah. And that's the kind of stuff he's doing, you know? Yeah. Stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. I like that. That's something that we are not good at right now is the low volume um, things. And, and we need to be better at that. And I know that, you know, we'll have companies and they want to run 50 or a hundred. And for us to do that, it's, it's pretty difficult. I think maybe, maybe I'm approaching it wrong and you can, you can tell me that. Um, but when we, when we do that, if we get a blanket order, we'll, we'll run 50 or a hundred for the same prices, you know, whatever the volume is. But if somebody's just in a, at a stage where they're not able to commit to those bigger volumes, um, you know, between material and then set up and, you know, all the other things it eats up an entire day on that machine. Uh, so we price that that way. And I'm not sure that we're doing, doing that properly right now. So we, we need to be, be better and figure out the lower volume stuff. Um, and I don't, I don't know if that's a, you know, clicker press or a laser or, you know, what the, what the appropriate way to go about that is yet. Yeah, it yeah, it, it, it's kind of a tricky one. It depends. We've I've got customers that do very low run jobs. I got one in particular that their average part order is, you know, twenty five to one hundred and fifty parts, wow. and they'll do a billion setups through the day. Um, it's all um, kind of low hanging fruit stuff. Not not real difficult to cut anything like that. Right. They'll turn and burn all day long and do them. Um, you know, laser is always really great for that, but you know, laser does some amazing things. Quick changeover, no tooling is is part of that, but mm -hmm. the lasers also come with a fairly significant price tag on them. Sure. Um, but uh, yeah, it 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 it's one of those things you can do it, but it re really comes down to you know, is the material easy? Am I have to do a boatload of you know, set up on it. If you've got some kiss cutting that's pretty fine on it, or you're doing a multi height die, where you're gonna have to tune it in for the kiss cut and the through cut. Yeah, you 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 could potentially run into that. Um, yeah, it's uh, but it, it's done. Yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe we explore that together uh, here in the near future because we I do think that we're we're missing out on the lower you know lower volume stuff that could potentially turn into higher volume stuff so yeah for sure push them out the door to somebody that could do the lower volume at a better price than we can and and they may never come back because that company could do the lower volume stuff and the big you know the higher volume stuff and right they have already created that relationship so yeah uh, yeah well and like you said too really short run stuff the clicker you know that's a that's a it's a 
really inexpensive press and really pretty well suited for doing small little short run or prototyping stuff. Sure. Um, sure. But, but yeah, like you said, you never know what, never know what, what a customer could turn into. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, and I'm like you, I have a hard time saying no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the yeah. reason that we own one of your presses, I guess. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome, man. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. I, I know that you're extremely busy and we've, you know, with our little glitch, we've been on here for, for a good amount of time. And why don't you tell everyone how they can get a hold of you? Um, we'll also put some links in the description and we do a blog. So we'll take this uh, entire podcast, and convert it to text and, and do a blog with it. So, um, you know, website, how they get a hold of you, phone number, any cool YouTube videos that you, you want to share, we could always, you know, put those on and, and all that fun stuff. Yeah, I completely appreciate it. Let me say again, Dustin, thank you so much for having me on. This is awesome. Yeah. Um, so our company website, uh, we're, we're Preco LLC, and our website is uh, www.precoLLC.com. You can contact me through there, um, or it's uh, my name, uh, Zach Haddock. It's Z Haddock, H-A-D-D-O-C-K, at PricoLLC.com. Um, I always preface this too. Don't, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, just because you're not necessarily looking for equipment. If you've just got a die cutting question, reach out to me. I'm happy to help. Um, I, I serve on the, the IADD, uh, which is the international association of die makers and, and die cutters on their technical team. Um, and we, we advise, uh, you know, people with die cutting issues. So don't ever hesitate to reach out. I'm always happy to help. Um, Dustin, you can attest to this. I kind of like talking shop. <laughs> so yeah. it's that's why we're here, right? Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we, we could definitely talk for, <laughs> for a lot longer. So, yeah. you know, maybe we do a follow up one and, you know, we do something more technical and dive into, uh, you know, oh, yeah. a little more granular in the weeds type of conversation. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, and then, yeah, our YouTube website, um, I've got a full list of uh, technical videos, how to on there, as well as just stuff about Preco and what we do. Yeah, you guys do a great job with your videos. I mean, they're just short, sweet, get to the point. Um, uh, my favorite ones are the old school ones where, you know, there's people smoking around the press. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people people with like full blown eighties mullets and Jeffrey oh, yeah, Dahmer glasses yeah. walking yeah. around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, those are but they're still I mean they're very uh you know, they're applicable to today. I mean some yeah. of those are they're they're great and you kinda of chuckle about them and, and that. Yeah. But we we had some video, not McMillan Co, but companies that I worked at. Like there were pictures on the website of you know, everyone's got a cigarette in their hand, like leaning up against the desk, smoking inside. It's like, man, times have changed. Yeah. Goodness. Yep. So, yep. so, yeah. Very yeah. Cool. When I moved into my office, there was a, in one of the counter cupboards, there was a bunch of ashtrays. <laughs> yeah. 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 The place I worked at had a, uh, a fan in the ceiling because they would smoke in this tiny little <laughs> conference room and it would suck all the, all the smoke out. So nice. I'm glad those days are over. I, yeah. Yeah. But awesome, man. Cool. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on. I appreciate it. It's always fun. And, and, yeah. uh, you know, keep, keep plugging away together. Yeah. Likewise. Take care. Yep. Thanks, man. Bye. Yep. Bye. Thanks everyone for joining us for this episode of MFG monkey. If you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, please email them to us at info at mfgmonkey.com.